I'm thinking maybe I should have brought my longboard out on the surf. These waves are really big, man. Oh, but God, help me today. I've got this relationship problem, God. And I really need your wisdom to help me get through it. Oh, but speaking of relationships, I was just a jerk yesterday with my friends. I can't believe it. Oh, these winds are just terrible. Can somebody put a fan on high on It's really cool. So yes, the winds, brother. I just, I want to believe you, but I can't believe you. Oh. Thank you, Randy. So what's the what's the issue going on with Randy? <laughs> Any? He's double minded. Yeah. Anybody else? He has to sense a little bit of doubt there that maybe he's not going to get what he's asking for because of certain reasons in his life or certain things he's done. But James says, if you ask and don't doubt, you will receive. And uh, in Proverbs uh, 4, verse 7, so you want to, or I have it right here, actually. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, and whatever you do, get insight. And Randy brought this up in Proverbs. But wisdom is so valuable in our lives. And it's, if it's something we lack, it's something that we can get and receive by asking from God for, for wisdom, just like Solomon did. Paul even asks for others to receive wisdom. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 18, Paul prays that the Ephesians would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they might understand Christ, his riches, what he's done. And he prays that they would receive that wisdom so that they could understand something that might not be easily understood. And so we need to be people who do not doubt when we ask. James chapter 3 verses 13 through 18 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impart... Uh, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So this wisdom that we receive that is from God is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And we want what comes from heaven, right? James 1.17, every good gift comes from above. And the wisdom that God gives is a good gift that we should seek. In James highlighting this, he makes it evident that it is necessary in our lives to be those who display Christ and the meekness, uh, our conduct in the meekness of wisdom. And for me, when I first came into YWAM, I was 18 years old and did my DTS and was a... Um, kind of a, a mean mouth young man. I didn't always have the nicest mouth on me, John could attribute. Um, I, yeah, just wasn't the nicest of persons. And in high school, I was also the same way, ran my mouth like crazy. And one of the things that I saw when I first came to YWAM and read, my, read the Bible for the first time was in the book of Ephesians, Paul prays for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And what I began to do is every single time I opened the scriptures, no matter if it was to read one sentence or read a whole book, I always would pray for wisdom and revelation every single time. And what began to happen in my life is people began to think I was older than I am. Like it happens a lot. 
like all the time. <laughs> People would come, I, I'm sure in Austin's DTS, he was like, man, this guy's like 25 or 26. And at the time I was probably like 20 years old. But like in, when I was in India this year or in Nepal, this guy thought I was in my 40s. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like th thanks dude, I'm 24 years old, great. But um, the reason is because the wisdom that's given from God is um, earned often through age, but God gives to those who ask without doubting. And in my life, I would say my life is a testimony to the reception of wisdom at a young age. Of I, In all humility, I'm not boasting or being prideful, but people will come to me and say, you have such wisdom or you carry such wisdom or you have wisdom in these situations. And I, I'm like, thanks, like definitely only from God because I'm not old enough to have that. And if, you, if that's something that you guys want in your life, if it's something that you want to walk out with the Lord and to have to represent him well, to live a godly life, ask for it and don't doubt. Because I can testify to the fact that God does give just like James says. That, James, that God does give to those who ask and do not doubt because he is faithful. And so are you, when you ask, are you doubting or are you believing that God will give it? Do you trust that he is going to come through and that he's going to pour it out? So we're going to, I'm going to finish this last one then we'll take a break here. Okay. Trials. Have someone uh, go to James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, or 2 through 4. Our response to the trials that we face will either lead us into great lack or into lack of nothing. We will continue to face the same trials over and over if we do not rise up and surmount those trials. And there's all sorts of trials that come our ways given in circumstances that are uh, outside of our control when things happen or shift in our family's lives or times in our Christian life where we might have um, been used or abused. But it's our response to those trials that James is after because you cannot change somebody else's action, but you can always change your reaction. And your reaction is going to show Christ in you to others. The way you react, the way you respond is going to show Christ to those people. I think about, I think it's Debbie who showed the clip of the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway. And the man who got up and stood and read his letter of forgiveness for, to Gary. And it's touching the forgiveness that he's releasing to this man who has done so much and hurt so many people's lives. But it's that, it's that man's reaction that displays what's inside of him, even though he cannot change the other person's action. And it's how we respond to the things that we face. And oftentimes in our lives, the trials that we are facing, we only look at them as a trial if there's something huge. But a trial can be something super small. And James says that each trial you face to receive it and to take it in joy because it is there to solidify your faith so that you are perseverant in your faith. So something as small as someone, you're at the dinner table eating dinner and someone accidentally spills their milk and it goes all over the table. What is your reaction to that? Because that that's a really small trial. But a lot of people would react 
very like would you know, throw their arms up like oh my god like like freak out about the spilled milk all over the table or it's you responding oh like sorry Joe, i'm gonna get you some more milk like napkins help mop them up that kind of deal how are you responding to the situations you're in all the way up to things like losing a family member what's your response in the midst of something like that how are you turning to the lord where is your heart and are we looking to Jesus? And I, I have not faced that many trials in my life, but, well, I've not faced that many dramatic trials. I've faced many trials that are very simple to face, but I have known that Christ is the one I always turn to. He's the rock I stand upon. And we have two options in life, and either we can build our life on the sand, like here, that shifts and moves. If you stand on a beach and are in the break of the waves, you will start to sink into the sand. And that is a very, very small picture of what a storm is like on sand. So if you stand there and you, you're gonna continue to sink into the sand because the water is washing the sand out from under you. It's not leaving you a foundation to stand on. If you go down to magic sands and stand in the break, you're going to have the sand washed out from under you. And that's what this is. This is just going to wash out from under you. But if you go and stand on one of the rocks at magic sands and the break comes up on you, you will never be moved. You will stand there all day on the rock as a foundation. And what is sand, you guys? What, what is sand? This is a real question. Dirt, itty bitty rocks. Sand is itty bitty rocks. And so you have a choice. Are you going to build your life on a bunch of itty bitty rocks or itty bitty Christs that you place as the savior of your life? Or are you going to build your life upon the one savior that will be standing in a storm? Because there's a lot of us who put a lot of saviors in our life and we have in the past and we see people in the world who have things as their savior and when their savior fails them, it falls out from under them just like sand on a shore break. But when Christ is your rock, no matter what you face, you will stand firm upon this. No matter what shore break you're standing in, no matter what storm comes, this will be your foundation. So which are you standing upon? Which are you building upon? And what are you helping others to build upon? Are you pointing people to Christ? Are you showing them Christ through your lifestyle, through your example? Are you somebody who is taking joy in the midst of your trials, knowing that the trial is there so that you can grow in your faith, so that you can grow closer to Jesus, so that you can be a better witness to other people, so that you can display Christ in your life? That we are to have joy because of what is coming before us. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 12, verse 2, the author says, that Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. And it is the same attitude that we face trials with, that we look to the joy that is set before us, the solidification of our faith, the realization of what Christ is doing in our life, that we endure the trial, we endure the difficulty. We endure what we're in the midst of because we look forward and say, I know Christ is doing something inside of me and I am wanting that more than getting out of the thing I'm in the midst of. And that's why you face it with joy. You don't face it with joy because a lot of trials are hard and it's gonna push on you and push your buttons and it's gonna be difficult, but you face it with joy because you know what's coming and that's what James says. You face it because you know what's on the other side. That's the same reason Jesus went to the cross. He didn't go to the cross because he wanted to go to the cross. He was in the garden asking his father that he could do anything else than go to the cross. But if it's his will, he'll do it. And then Hebrews tells us that he did it because he saw what he was going to get, that he endured it. So pressures will come and pressures will push on you. Trials and storms will push on you. And they will push things out of you. And often the trials in your life will show you what's inside of you as well. How you react under pressure, how you react in difficulties. That will show what is inside of you because the pressure pushes things out of you. 
So let's be patient in trials because we know what they are there for. We know that they are there to solidify our faith, that we would become more like Christ in every way. The trials come so that we will be molded into his image. That they're the pressures that come, just like the pressures on a piece of coal that turns it into a diamond. That these harder pressures turn the coal into a diamond. And what we are doing is the harder pressures are pushing on us to turn us into Christ. And we know the result that comes because of the pressures that push upon us. And we are looking towards the results that comes and not just the midst of the circumstances. But we have to make the choices in the midst of the circumstances to attain the results that we're hoping for. So how do you respond to trials and difficulties? What is your response? And which rock are you building on? All right, let me pray real quick. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for this time this morning. Thank you so much for the book of James. God, for these five topics, Lord, and how important they are to our life today, Jesus. And that, yeah, James pulls these things into our life so that we might better understand them, God, and that we would really apply it, Jesus, that we'd take it and make faith into action, Lord Father God, in our lives, that we would display what we believe, we display who we are, and we'd be following you with a full devotion, God, knowing the hope that is on the other side of every trial and difficulty, God. Let us be people who are wise, God, and ask it of you, Lord, because you are ready to give. Jesus, we love you so much. We're so thankful for all that you're doing in our hearts, God. And would your word really inspire change in our lives? That it wouldn't just be what we know and that we wouldn't just learn about the Bible, but we would apply it and do something about it. Thank you, Lord, so much for your word and bless our break. Amen. So we will come back just past 1035. So I'll call us back at the time.
Okay, everybody, we're going to call it back and get started here in just about a minute. <clears throat> Uh, everybody outside, getting started. Yes, Papa Burgess, I'm here. Papa Burgess, how are you? Good. 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 All right. <clears throat> so let's get rolling. Regarding the book of James, does anybody have any questions or anything that as they were reading were confused about or thoughts? Anything regarding the book of James? Yes. You kind of alluded to it, but the one where it says don't worry about tomorrow. So that's in the context of money. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like because of what James is talking about in the rest of the letter and the flow of his themes, that it probably is dealing mostly with the rich gaining riches and being concerned with gaining riches. Yeah. So, obviously, we too should not be concerned about tomorrow. Jesus says it in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Um, but, yeah, in this context, it seems like James is specifically talking to people who were, had the intention of, like, going out and earning money. So, yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Concerns? Conundrums? Okay. Gentile. Sorry, I meant the um, Jerusalem Council when I was thinking about the Gentile inclusion, like the Jerusalem Council. Okay. Sorry, that's what I meant. I probably was saying it over and over, but um, the Jerusalem Council is the one that, um, when it looks like there's the mass inclusion of the Gentiles and all that kind of stuff, so. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, so yeah, that was a little confusing. That's. Well, that's generally where it's placed before the Jerusalem Council, which is takes place in 49 or 50 AD. So, all right, let's talk about First Peter. Yes. For Jerusalem Council. Um, like for in your writing or yeah because you're not going to be able to find like dates inside the Bible um, or specific dates but that is our pretty solid point of reference for the scripture is the Jerusalem Council so that's generally you talk about things in relation to the Jerusalem Council and there's another guy um, the procurator of uh, Corinth um, Gallio 
and there was an inscription, sorry, I'm going to take a little detour. There's an inscription found in Corinth that says Gallio was procurator in 52 AD in Corinth, and that was discovered in an archaeological dig. It doesn't say 52 AD because they didn't have that dating system yet, but based on the dating systems that we have now and looking at theirs, we know he was there in 52 AD. So we can place Acts chapter 18 at 52 AD, and that is a very, the most specific point of reference for the New Testament. And so that's where we base a lot of our time off of. It's kind of like a compass. So that's how we know dates and times and judging off there. And so when Luke says like two years from here or so like this many years from there, that's how we know is because of Gallio being procurator or proconsul, either one. Uh, Acts 18. Yeah, so Luke, okay, this is, Danny didn't hit on this, but I'm gonna hit it real quick. Luke is uh, on par with all Roman historians of the first century. So Luke writes historical work that is equal to Tacitus and Josephus and other Roman historians. So for example, Luke, the, the part at the end of Acts where you read about Paul's journey from Caesarea all the way to Rome and he sails by all these places and you're like, why the heck is all this sailing chapters in the book of Acts? Like I wanna read about preaching the gospel and all I'm reading about is people sailing a ship. Those chapters in the book of Acts are the most clear um, workings of first century marinership in the history of the world. So Luke is used by secular historians to learn about first century sailing. And in the 1970s, a man with only the book of Acts and a compass and a star chart followed the exact same trail on the Sea of the Mediterranean that Paul and his company followed and wound up at the exact same sandbar where they crashed. Yeah. So um, everything he writes in the book of Acts is ridiculous, like historically accurate. Luke writes just the same as any historian would have written, and his book looks like a piece of history. So Luke's the man, and he, because of his accuracy in historical writing, we are able to have such clear dates and um, knowledge of first century Christianity. Yeah, so Luke is the man, and uh, yeah, he has amazing Greek, and actually in Greek, his letter or his books are very pleasurable to read, his writing styles and everything like that. So Luke's an educated man. I, I could talk about Acts as one of my favorite books to teach, so, um, but we're not on Acts. So First Peter, here we go. Uh, living in holiness amidst suffering. Suffering of two R's at the end? I think that's okay. All right. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the author and then the style of the letter and the recipients of the letter. Then we'll talk about the date, um, the historical context, and then we'll go into talking about the book itself. So there's your little roadmap for the next hour and 20 minutes. So who wrote the book? Peter, sorry to disappoint you, but Sylvanus actually wrote the book, or Silas. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, Silas is the one who writes the letter. Now, Paul, Peter's the one who dictates the letter, and he's the one who speaks it, but Silas is the one who writes it. You'll see the same thing in the book of uh, Romans as well. At the end of the book of Romans, if you got there, you'll see that some other guy wrote the letter, and Paul was the one speaking it. So this is a very common practice. Usually, probably nobody in the New Testament wrote their own letters. They all spoke them, and somebody else wrote them down. So the, one of the few times you actually see somebody saying they wrote their own letter is in the book of Galatians. So if you read the book of Galatians yesterday, at the end of the book of Galatians, Paul says, see what big hand I'm writing with. Like, see the letters I'm writing with. Well, it doesn't look any different in your Bible, but the original letter it would have changed writing styles and you would have seen that the person who was writing the letter for Paul stops writing and then Paul writes the rest of the letter. So 
um, that's what you're looking at there. And that's, so Peter is the one who writes the letter. All these men wrote the letters, but um, they dictated them to somebody. So what can we learn about Peter from the book of 1 Peter? Anybody have any thoughts? What do you guys know about Peter from 1 Peter? He's an apostle. Yes. Opening verse there. 1-1. One, one. What else do we know about him? The slave to God? Yep. Anybody else? About 5-1. Five, 5-1 one. Five, one says he's a witness to Christ's sufferings. So we know that this is Peter. There's very few people who would have been witnesses to Christ's sufferings. And so that's one of the things that points to him being who he says he is. Um, also, the letter has a heavy Jewish feel to it. The, um, thing, the place he writes from, the analogies he uses, and the uh, words that he writes, for example, the living stones being built into a temple, um, the Jewish quotes, be holy as I am holy, um, talking about um, royal priesthood, holy nation. It's very Jewish feeling. So Peter's writing very Jewishly in this letter. He's a Jew, so we can only assume and um, at this time, Peter's in Rome. And the reason we know he's in Rome is because of what first century Christians used as a code word for Rome. So at the end of the book of First Peter, it says, She who is in Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Who is she? The church. She is the church. That's who Paul, Peter is referring to. So she who is in Babylon, and Babylon is Rome. It was viewed as a, the place of exile. So this main center hub, um, as the um, Christians looked at um, their lives, they looked as themselves as exiles in this land, as people who are residents here setting an example for Christ, but maybe not belonging all the time. And Babylon is this picture, just like Babylon was to the Jews who took them into exile, and they were exiles in Babylon, so are they exiles in the Roman Empire. And just like Babylon, the capital of the Babylonian Empire, so Rome is the capital of the Roman Empire, and they view that as code word, talking about it as Babylon. So you get a lot of, a, a lot of allusions or code language in here. Um, at the beginning, Peter says, um, to those who are elect exiles, and we know that there are no exiles at this time, but they're exiles in the sense of exiled from their citizenship in heaven because they're not present there right now. And then he calls them the dispersion. Um, he will call them other names throughout the text. And so we do know that Peter is writing very uh, metaphorically or elusive to certain things. And that would be to the Christians. So he's using Jewish language to allude to the body of Christ. So she is the church. Babylon is Rome. And we know this because it says, who is likewise chosen? So the people that Peter's writing to have been chosen. And likewise, the church in Rome has been chosen. They are elect exiles, just like he says in 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. And then Mark, my son, sends greetings. Who else do we know calls somebody else their son in the text? Timothy. Paul and Timothy. So Paul calls Timothy his son. Is he his real son? No, he's not. So would you think that Mark is Peter's son? Probably not. We do know that Peter was married. Paul says that in the Corinthians. But we have no talk of children or anything like that. So this Mark, who is his son, is probably Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. And Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, writes the Gospel of Mark after Peter's testimony. So Mark went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, right? Then he gets scared and he goes back home. And then the second missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas are like, okay, let's go. And Barnabas is like, hey, let's bring Mark. And Paul's like, no, I'm out deuces and goes with Silas and cruises around Asia Minor. And this Mark you don't really hear about until you hear about him mentioned in both 1 Peter and in uh, one of Paul's letters. I think it's in the book of Colossians that he's mentioned. And Mark is a translator. He's an interpreter. So tradition holds that Mark was Peter's translator in Rome. And that as Peter went to minister and plant the church in Rome, 
Mark followed him and was his translator to the Romans. So Mark probably spoke Latin and Greek and also Hebrew and other languages as well. Because we know that Greek was the common language spoken throughout the land, but Mark probably spoke other languages. It, um, at the end of the book of Mark, you read that little passage where that little boy runs away naked. People assume that's Mark throwing himself in there. Like, hey guys, look at me. Like, ran away naked. Um, it's also tradition that the upper room that the disciples were meeting in is actually Mark's parents' house. And that um, because they had an upper room, they were a wealthy people, and thus Mark had the ability to gain other languages because of his societal class. So all of this, a lot of it's tradition, um, pulling from different parts of scripture and adding them together, but that's basically who Mark is. So Mark is his dear close son. He writes the gospel of Mark after translating for Peter all of these things. Peter gets martyred, and then he writes the gospel of Mark, probably, or before that time. So the date of first Peter, what kind of things in the letter point you towards a date? Now with these questions, you guys, I know a lot of speakers have not asked you these questions and a lot of them have given answers to you guys, but what we want to work in you guys is an ability to find things in the scripture and make, to make inductive decisions off of what's in the scripture. So as you see something in scripture, you don't just take it for face value, but you say, okay, why do we think this? What in the letter points us towards the situation? What in the letter points us towards who this man was or who the author was, that kind of stuff. So what in this letter points you towards the time of writing? The believers have been scattered, yeah. So there's believers all over the place. Yeah, did you mention something, Pine? Suffering. Yeah, so suffering is a huge theme in the letter, mentioned over and over and over. Sheree? Yeah. So this is probably the Neronian persecution time. So um, depending on the scholar you read or listen to, they will say the Neronian persecution, the persecution under Nero, was strictly in Rome or spread throughout the Roman Empire. So there's kind of two camps in this. I'm more of the camp that the persecution spread but was not as um, heavy throughout the empire as it was in Rome. So it looks like it'd be during the Neronian persecution time, which would place it around 64 AD. So it's around 64 AD and that's what we're looking at around the time of the Neronian persecution. So the Neronian persecution happened because the Jews were now separate from the Christians or the Christians were separate from the Jews. So we know Judaism was a protected religion in Rome, right? In the Roman Empire because it was an old religion. But when Christianity began to rise up, it was no longer a protected religion because it was separate from, the Juda uh, from Judaism. So because it was separated from Judaism, the Christians now faced persecution because the Roman Empire did not like new, uh, new religions. So they've been separated and now they are facing persecution. And like Pine said, a major theme in the book is suffering, something you'll see over and over and over. They're encouraged in the midst of their suffering. They're encouraged to view Christ in his suffering. Um, the opening passages talks about being tried and in fire and like pressing through and pressing on and setting an example in chapter three and chapter two um, of being an example and then constant messages of suffering and suffering and suffering and being people who are perseverant in the midst of suffering. And what is the example that they're showing? Now, the people that it's written to are in this area. So in the beginning of the letter, you'll see like Cappadocia, Galatia, Pontius, Asia, and um, one other one. I don't remember. Sorry? Pathinia. So Galatia is here, Cappadocia is here, um, Bithynia and Pontius is, are here, and so it's like this area. This area in Roman times is called Asia Minor. Okay, so when P Peter says I'm writing like to those who are in Asia, it's this, it's not like China, okay? So he's writing to this area right here, Turkey. So you can think of Turkey. Paul is writing to the nation of Turkey. 
and those are the people he's sending the letter to. So that gives you a little bit of the context, um, uh, the Roman colonies there, and th that's where our people are at. So the population of the letter, the audience of the letter, what kind of things can you tell about the audience of the letter? They're believers, yes. So who, who do we know, what do we know about the people in the, that are being written to? Yeah, verse one, we see where they're at. Let's, let me point you to chapter two, verse 12. What does that tell us about the people that the letter is being written to? What do you think it tells you? They're living among non-believers, yes. Yeah, so the non-believers are watching them, yeah. What do we know about the people themselves that are being written to? What could you allude to because of that passage? Sorry, I got two answers there. Maybe they're not living properly, yeah. Yeah, the Jewish converts, Jewish Christians. Yeah, that's what I would say it points towards. Is if it was pointing towards Gentiles, you wouldn't have to say live in front of the Gentiles, right? Like, I'm, I'm not gonna say to a Gentile, like you need to watch how you're acting in front of Gentiles. But I would say to a Jew, you need to watch how you're acting in front of Gentiles because there has been that separation in the past. So we do know there's a considerable Jewish population he's writing to, or that we can allude to that and assume that. And we can also allude to that and assume that because of the Jewish nature of the letter, how he opens the letter talking about exile, talking about the dispersion, and then he goes on to talk heavily um, about the lifestyle they live and holiness and the living stones. He alludes to the temple. He talks about them being his people. But right before that, we come to this passage that says, um, right here in verse 10. Once you were not my people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have mercy. So who were once not God's people? Gentiles, great. Who are now God's people? Gentiles, Gentiles. awesome. So they have once not been God's people, and now Peter's saying you have been made God's people. Once you did not receive mercy, now you receive mercy. So it's this allusion to the audience that we're looking for of who he's writing to. So those two verses help us see those things. Now, there's more in the letter, and I'm not saying we build all of what we understand off of these two verses, but that's kind of the, that kind of thing will help you see what is in the letter, who the letter is being written to. So we have a Gentile and a Jewish audience that we're looking at. And we know this because of the inclusion that is mentioned. Verse nine and 10, this, you are a chosen uh, race, a royal priesthood. And then it goes on to say, you were not my people, but now you are my people. So that's right out of Hosea, this message that uh, Hosea preaches with the names of his children. So um, we know that they are the people of God now. And, but it also, so it carries this message to the Jews and the Gentiles, but it also carries a very he heavy Jewish tone to it. And it, we see that through the illusions of exile and dispersion of Babylon, of um, all of these things coming up. So that's who we're looking at. And the um, message that Peter's trying to convey with the words he's using is similar to that of the exile. Do not view the exile as the final resting place. And just like the Jews got caught up in that idea that, oh, the exile is just where we're going to settle. And then, do you guys remember how many Jews were taken into exile? Do you remember about how many? Did, they, did we talk about that? I was gone at the time. 50,000 back. Do you remember how many went into exile? So we're looking at about 2 million that went into exile. So about 2 million people are taken by Babylon to Babylon. 
or to the surrounding areas. So two million Jews are taken to Babylon. And then only 50,000 come back. That's a lot less. And that's why it's so hard to rebuild the temple. That's why it's so hard to repopulate the land. That's why it's so hard to take care of the land they had come out of. And why the opposition they faced was so difficult. Because they, they left 2 million and they came back 50,000. Now, I'm not saying that that was the wrong thing to do at the time. I wish more people had come back. Be, but because of those who stayed, the gospel spread quicker, which praise the Lord. That was his divine plan. But what I want you guys to see is that just like Peter is saying to these people now, so was Jeremiah saying to the people then. Don't just settle in the land. Be examples that this isn't your final resting place, but you are to be people who have a, hold your citizenship in heaven, but are residents here for this time. And while you are here in this life, being residents, be examples. Be people who show yourself as Christ's example to others. And so that's what Peter is really trying to convey to his audience is he wants them to be people who are, ev who are the evidence of Christ in the midst of their circumstance. So they're not just looking about planting and staying and remaining in this place, but they are exiles looking towards a greater land. All right. So the historical context of suffering. Now, in our day and age, we view suffering as a bad thing. Suffering is a terrible thing, and when you're suffering, you want to get out of it. But as you saw in the book of Acts, the apostles were, were happy to share in the sufferings of Christ. They viewed sharing in the suffering of Christ as getting closer to their salvation. And walking in and sharing the sufferings of Christ, sharing the suffering of Christ was to the first century church a, what a lot of sanctification was to us, what we view sanctification as today. So like the suffering they went through, the suffering they faced, they viewed a lot of sanct that as like what we think of sanctification, like their salvation was being worked out inside of them. That their, the, the, um, their flesh was being like worked out so be, they were becoming more like Christ. And so the first century church and the early church that faced the persecution of the Roman empire viewed the sufferings as a joyous occasion because they got to show their faith to other people and they got to live out what Christ had called them to. In the early Roman empire, people who faced persecution would be brought before an altar often of Caesar and been demanded to bow down and call Caesar Lord. And if they did not bow down, call Caesar Lord and offer incense to this idol, then they would be killed. And there are testimony after testimony after testimony of Christians who came before these altars and would not bow down and they would just be killed. And there's, we have, um, historical documents of letters being written between governors and um, other officials in the land talking about the reluctance of the Christians to relent and how they did not give in to the persecution and how they were just slaughtering their population because nobody was giving in, because nothing was changing. That they could not believe the example the Christians were setting, that they would die for this. And so that's what we're looking into right now is these people are facing maybe not death at this point, but there will be death under Vespasian and um, Domitian uh, in the next following uh, four decades. But under Nero, throughout the empire, there would have been persecution of Christians. And these people are called to set an example in the midst of that. And although we're not facing the same persecutions that they were, we can still set an example in the midst of all of our circumstances. That no matter what we face, we can be people who live out that example. And when they um, suffered, they never viewed it as vain suffering. But every single time they suffered, they viewed it as suffering on, for God's sake and for Christ's sake. They suffered on behalf of Christ. They never suffered for no reason that their perspective in the midst of their difficulties was doing it on behalf of Christ to show him worthy, to show him glory. It was one of their um, 
most loving expressions of commitment to Christ to endure suffering, and they counted it a joy. The story of Peter, when he was in Rome during the Neronian persecution, all of the church leaders told him to leave. All of them came to him and said, Peter, you need to leave because of the pillar you are to the church, because you are a man who is um, our representative, who's building the church, who's the leader of the church. We need you to live so that you can continue spreading the gospel. And Peter received their wisdom. He said, yes, you're, you're right. And that night, he was leaving, Jeru or leaving um, Rome with the elders of the church. He was leaving Rome. And as he was leaving Rome, uh, the tradition says as he was leaving Rome, he was stopped on the road and saw Jesus walking back into Rome, not saying anything. And as he saw Jesus walk back into Rome past him, he realized that it was his time and that he was supposed to follow Christ and not um, deny him in that way, but to declare his faith and to stand up as a man who is willing to be martyred for the faith. It was within the next coming weeks that tradition says that Peter was arrested and put into Mamertime time prison, which is also where Paul was in prison at. And some scholars would say they were in prison at the same time together. And um, then Peter was brought out and he was going to be crucified because that was the most common way to, um, for capital punishment in the Roman Empire. Tons of people were crucified. When um, Jerusalem fell in 70 AD and the Roman uh, Empire was uh, killing the Jewish uh, nation there, they cru 